Hello, welcome to Taking Back Organic with Dave Chapman at NOFA New Hampshire's 20th Annual Winter Conference. I'm Laura Andrews, NOFA New Hampshire's Program Coordinator, and I'll be hosting this session with Carl Johnson, President of NOFA New Hampshire's Board of Directors. Um, first, please note that we're recording this session um, and all sessions this week throughout the conference, and we'll share the recordings with you um, at the end of the week. Um, we also will make a link to recordings available on that workshop links page um, that you've been using to access the workshops um, earlier. <laughs> uh, so please note that everyone will be muted during the workshop um, and type your questions into the chat box throughout the discussion. I will read out your questions when we get to the Q&A portion of the session. Uh, NOFA New Hampshire's Winter Conference is supposed to foster an open, welcoming environment and safe space for everyone. So please keep your questions and comments constructive in the chat. Um, and for technical issues, please feel free to communicate publicly through the chat or message me or NOFA NH privately. That will also go to me. Um, and if you would like to access closed captioning, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Click the arrow on the CC icon and then click show subtitle. And if you're watching on a smaller screen, click the three buttons, three dots at the bottom of your Zoom screen that read more, and then click the show subtitle option. Now, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this conference is taking place on the land of the Penacook tribe or Indakana the Abenaki word for the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples past and present. And we acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and the Almobac or people who have stewarded this land through the generations. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dave Chapman of the Real Organic Project. Thank you, Laura. I don't suppose there's any way to show everybody on the screen, is there? Uh, do you have it set in gallery view? Uh, let's see what I have it set in. I do. Okay. And I uh, see you and Joan. I mean, it's okay if we can. It's just nice to oh, yeah. see people here. And, yeah. you know, we're yes. not that that big a crowd. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and we'll only post the the version where it shows the speaker view. So if you show yourself now, it will not end up in the recording <laughs> yeah. to the audience. It's only fair, right? I mean, you know, I'm so tired of talking to a blank screen, mm -hmm. seeing myself, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, it's great to be here tonight. Um, you know, I just got done with. Uh, our symposium, the Real Organic Project Symposium, Milk and Money. And uh, it was wonderful because it wasn't just about the problems at all. It was a lot about the solutions. And I think that we do need to talk about and look at the problems. Um, otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense what we're talking about. So uh, I think that the... <clears throat> This year, when, when um, Horizon announced it was abandoning all of its contracts in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, and about half of its contracts in New York, it, it really brought it home. And it brought it home to the, the uh, part of the country that has the, the uh, best organic programs in the country, in my opinion. I once asked uh, Sam Smith, who is, runs uh, OneCert, and he is a wonderful champion for organic integrity, and they certify all around the world. And I said, Sam, I'm just kind of curious, what do you think of Vermont organic farmers? And he said, oh, they're the very best. And he said, and the further you get from Vermont, the worse it gets, except for OneCert, <laughs> which is out in Nebraska or something. And, uh, and I actually, you know, that's not entirely true, but there's a lot of truth to it, which is, you know, as one of the speakers in the symposium said, you know, that in New Hampshire and Vermont, in Maine, in Pennsylvania, in New York, Aurora Dairy would never be certified by the by those regional certifiers. 
So only in places where the, the certifiers are not so um, committed to integrity and transparency does it happen that we get 7,000 cow CAFOs being certified as organic. And I think that, you know, there was some sense of, I don't know, that these problems in the country aren't our problems. You know, we genuinely um, have organic programs that we can trust and we don't see the problems. So sometimes when I go out and I talk about hydroponics, it's like, well, there are no hydroponic producers being certified as organic here. And you talk about CAFOs and they go, I don't know what you're talking about. There are no CAFOs being certified as organic here. We have a good, strong system and we do. But what Horizon brought home is that we are not isolated from the bigger system. We are part of it. That's what makes it a system. And we are deeply impacted by it. Um, Maine is facing the loss of 20% of their certified organic dairies and Vermont 10%. And I think if you factor in Maple Hills farms that got dropped, New York is looking at 10% loss of their organic dairies. So these are, these are huge impacts in, on our community. Uh, what was it Gary Hirschberg said? Uh, uh, $82 million worth of milk being sold that is not gonna be sold unless unless something happens to turn this around. This is a big deal. It's a big deal for our organic program. It's a big deal for the local economy. It's a big deal for the eaters who want to buy that milk. And, <clears throat> you know, I, I was very unhappy it, it happened, but it really demonstrated to all of us that we are not um, on the other side of some wall where we're not affected by what happens in California or Texas or, or anywhere else in Colorado, anywhere else in the country, um, what they do impacts us and what we do impacts them. We don't have the economic clout of California or Texas. Um, we can't tell Horizon what to do, what well, we can, but they won't listen. Um, but we can speak up. And the more that we do speak up, the more that we start to rebuild the organic movement. And the organic movement has continued pretty strong up here. It's not so strong in the rest of the country. It's there, it's there all over, but it, it needs to be brought together to have enough critical mass to turn this thing around, which I think it is turnable or roundable. I'm not, I'm not optimistic that we will be able to reform the USDA. And that's why the Real Organic Project is not a reform movement. Uh, we try, just like, just like all the NOFAs and, and NOC and Organic Farmers Association. I'm part of all that. But Real Organic Project is about creating the alternative to the USDA. And it's just about reclaiming organic. It's, we're an add-on for people who don't know in order to be certified with Real Organic Project, you have to be certified through the National Organic Program. So we're not trying to kill the National Organic Program, we're trying to save it. But I doubt that we will be able to reform it because we are up against literally billions of dollars that don't want it to be reformed. And it's gonna be pretty hard to sway the, the politicians who do get involved and the bureaucrats who get chosen by them, it's just how it is. <clears throat> so that's why we started the Real Organic Project. Um, that was about three years ago, to beginning of 2018. And uh, I guess that's pushing four years ago, isn't it? Um, and it was started by farmers after um, a very disastrous meeting uh, of the National Organic Standards Board down in Jacksonville, Florida, in which for the first time, the National Organic Standards Board did not come out strongly in opposition to the certification of hydroponics uh, as organic. And that was despite the fact that 60 farmers came up from around the country to urge them to do the right thing. But uh, a relative handful of lobbyists 
pretty much from the West Coast, came in to urge them to do the wrong thing. And we lost that. You know, we didn't even get a simple majority and we needed two thirds just to reaffirm a recommendation that had been passed in 2010 by that same group and that had passed overwhelmingly with one vote opposing it. And uh, this time we couldn't even get a simple majority. So we came back to Vermont uh, and we came back to everywhere. Uh, there were people from all over, but the group of farmers from Vermont were, were pretty upset. And we had a meeting at the NOFA headquarters. And uh, I think about 30 of us packed into this little, little conference room, if you've ever been to the NOFA headquarters in, in uh, Rich, uh, Richmond. And um, we said, what are we going to do? Are we going to just shrug and say, this is the way it goes. We can't do anything about it. And we'll just put up with it because things are pretty good in Vermont. And um, it was absolute consensus that we weren't going to do that. Everybody there said, we need to do something. Can we create our own label? And we said, OK, should it be an add-on or a standalone? Now, this was not a consensus. And the majority thought it should be a standalone. And I was like, Jesus, <laughs> really? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to break away and have to fight over the word organic. And, you know, the two biggest vegetable farmers in the state were there and they both wanted to stand alone. And I, I was kind of amazed. But as the meetings continued after this, it, 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 it thinned out of like, who's actually going to do the work? And we decided to do an add-on label. And that's where we are and that's where we stayed and it's nice because that way we're not declaring war on our friends the certifiers because we have great certifiers in the northeast it's a little different in other places but it's not here it's it's great you know i i talk about other places i just want to say right now ccof is the biggest certifier of hydroponic as organic in the world right they certify Driscoll's, they certify Wholesome Harvest. And, you know, those two alone probably make up over half of the sales of, of hydroponic certified as organic. They're, they're both big companies. Driscoll's a very big company. And, you know, Oregon Tilth certifies CAFOs and they'll certify hydroponics too. This is heartbreaking to me. These two, these two organizations were like heroes of ours in the East. We're like, God, they really have it together out in California. And they've got this great grassroots movement that's really matured and, and developed and gotten very big. But the truth is the farmers have lost control of those organizations. And um, there's a lot of money in certification if you certify those big players. And that's what they're doing. And I'm sure they believe in it. I don't, I don't want to... Um, you know, say, well, those are bad people or they're, they're, they're cheaters. I think that the people who are doing it believe in it. They think, well, we're building a big tent and, and it's important that we welcome all in. We got to get these big corporations in if we're going to change the world. I, I welcome the big corporations if they will come in and play by our rules, but they don't. And, uh, you know, this is an old playbook. They, they come in and say, we want to be part of this. And they come in and they say, but, you know, and it's pretty hard when they're paying the, the, the power bill, you know, and the lights are going to go out if they leave. All of a sudden, the conversation changes very much. So, you know, there's the big tent philosophy. One of the, one of the people that I interviewed in um, the symposium that was just over was Bernward Gaia. And he's a, a German. He's been around in the organic movement a long time. He was an early director of iPhoam world. And um, iPhoam is the international body, international federation of organic agricultural movements. And it's a, it is an umbrella, it is a big tent. And it's, it, it has organizations from all over the world. The North American organization is very weak. It's probably the weakest one because 
we have our own organizations here. We're not too connected to the international movement. And, but we should be. I mean, whether we do it through iPhone or not, we should be, because we are all in this together. So I asked Bernard, I said, well, have you been able in the EU to grow organic and still keep the integrity, you know, and not have corporations come in and change the rules? And he said, absolutely. You know, we're growing rapidly. They're kind of, I don't know, about $5 billion behind the US, but they're, we're all growing at about the same rate. They're, you know, 50, 55 billion, we're at 60, 60, 64 billion in organic sales. And so they are able to keep right up and they're doing it and they're not certifying hydroponics at all. They're not certifying CAFOs at all. And it's clearly against the rules. So we can't say, well, you know, if we, if we try to be, oh, I love it when they call us purists. If we try to be purists, in other words, we stick with the meaning of organic, does that mean we're killing organic? And the answer is no. It means that we give what we actually intend an opportunity to grow. And we do exactly what organic certification was meant to be, which was to protect it, protect the organic movement from that kind of fraud. fraud. So in those three and a half years that, that Real Organic has been in existence, we have certified 850 farms across the country with our add-on label. And, um, and they come from New Hampshire and they come from Vermont and they come from Maine and New York and Massachusetts and all and a lot in California and Oregon um, and all over and, you know, Oklahoma and Hawaii and, you know, North Dakota and Nebraska. So, you know, all different kinds of farms and very different politically, I would add, we're sort of used to in 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 Vermont, where everyone sort of agrees politically, well, this group doesn't. They they have lots of political opinions, and that's fine because there are th important things that we do agree on, and um, we agree that organic is based on healthy soil, and we agree that that should not the rules should not be dictated by corporations, and, and there is consensus on that a hundred percent, and I think that that is. I'm pretty certain that that is the consensus of, of the whole organic movement. And I include in that the farms that are not certified because they choose not to be and the farms that are certified. So there are some great organic farms that have chosen not to be certified. And of course, Elliot Coleman's farm is, is an extremely prominent example of that uh, four season farm in Maine. And um, so I will never say you must be certified in order to be organic. But I think there are really good reasons for certification. It helps us to build a movement and it certainly helps us to find access to store shelves. The problem is right now that certification is being used against us so that we're, we're seeing farms pushed out of the store shelves. They're playing by the rules, but, but other people are being labeled as if they were the same. And of course the, the CAFO dairies are the latest glaring example where we see farms that are gonna go out of business unless plan B works somehow. And it, it's, not, it's not easy for them to get a contract even in, with, in a conventional market at this point. So, and you know, there are berry people for sure going out of business. We see tomato people going out of business, you know, or, or having to move to alternate crops. Uh, and, and some of them are very bitter because they have done everything right. And you go to their farms and you go, you're, you're a great organic farmer. And, and in the case of berries, they're not even, they're literally not allowed on the shelves. You know, we're, we're dealing with a genuine monopoly there and, and it's a closed shop. All right, so a few other things maybe. And then maybe we'll we'll go to questions, have a, more of a conversation if we can. Um, there is a movement that I think is important to mention, which is in Europe. They have something called farm to fork. 
kind of like farm to table. But it's an initiative of the EU government, and they have made the commitment to, I believe by 2030, to reduce across the EU pesticide use in all agriculture by 50%. And they've made a commitment to take organic, certified organic land to 25%. And this is a huge deal. It's barely been mentioned in the US. And the people who have mentioned it are attacking it. I was talking to a really nice journalist I know who often writes for Civil East. And she said, yeah, I was at a Midwest farming conference. And ooh, boy, were they trashing farm to fork. I mean, everybody was down on it. I'm like, why would they be down on it? And they're down on it because the chemical companies, the chemical ag companies hate it because this is seen as a declaration of war, not in the US, in Africa, in Asia, in South America. There's a battle going on right now for world agriculture. And frankly, it's the good guys versus the bad guys. So our USDA is an enemy of the Farm to Fork Initiative, and they're using all kinds of leverage to try and shut it down, saying, well, you know, we're not going to sell to you if you do this. And, you know, there are going to be some reprisals here. And I just want us to all be aware of it. We need to fight for this. This is, this is the government that we wish we would have. This is the kind of action that is what we've all wanted. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not shutting down conventional agriculture. It's trying to make it a lot less chemical. You might say it's trying to make it more regenerative, but it's also trying to say, let's take organic and that by that they mean real organic and let's grow it to be 25% of our land certified. America right now is at, I think, one and a half percent. So they're, they're, I don't know where they're at, six or 10%, some, somewhere in there, it depends. I don't know what the average for the whole EU is. I think in Denmark, they're at 10%. Vermont's at 11% of our farmland is certified organic, which sounds great, but I think it includes an awful lot of maple syrup. <laughs> so, you know, great swaths of forest. It's good, it's good, but you know, uh, we, want, we want to get to 25%, we want to get to 50%. What the hell? Let's get to 100%. You know, in New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine, it's possible for us to do things that the rest of the country just can't do. If we actually thought about how to do that, I'm really thinking about trying to start something like this in Vermont. And, you know, I know the consultant I want to hire, it's the guy I interviewed in Denmark. He's actually an American. And They've just done an amazing job. They got the restaurants posting what percentage of what they buy is organic. And they're talking about like 60%, right? And they take great pride in it in the public kitchens. Even the prisons are serving organic food. And when they do that, of course, everyone gets a little healthier and they provide a market for a different kind of farming. And as he points out, all the political parties in Denmark, except the fascists, but nine other parties support this, right? So this can be bipartisan in every sense of the word, except for the fascists. So. <laughs> I, you know, they don't like it. But, but so, you know, it's just, we don't have to be frozen is what I'm saying. We can act and, and you know, they've done it by creating alliances, with the environmental movement, with the labor movement. This is good for everybody. And, and they're working with different political parties and they're saying, let's change, let's change how we farm. And I think in America, that's too big, that's overwhelming. And you go, my head's gonna explode. How do we go up against, you know, Secretary Vilsack and Bear Monsanto and Syngenta, you know, and Cargill, most of whom are members of the Organic Trade Association. So you know, that's what comes of a big tent. Not, not, not Bear Monsanto, but Cargill, yes, right? General Mills, yes. So, you know, it would be good if they meant it, but I don't think that they mean it. General Mills was very excited about, about all the 
land that they've gotten certified organic. Um, but now they've moved on to regenerative. We should probably mention the regenerative movement. Regenerative is wonderful and real regenerative and real organic are pretty much the same thing. But regenerative as it's come to be defined by American corporations is whatever they want it to mean. There is no legal definition. So it's whatever you say it is. General Mills rather famously showed up at Expo West, the big West Coast trade show for natural foods, sustainable natural farming, and had like a block long display of, of that they were taking a million acres regenerative. And that meant a million acres of glyphosate, right? So just to be clear, they're not talking about stopping using chemicals. They're not talking about stopping using herbicides. They're just talking about a little less tillage. And to be clear, in a lot of America right now, that is displacing organic as what people look to as the solution. And I've had enormously powerful, influential, wonderful people tell me, well, you know, organic was great, but they left out the climate and regenerative gets the climate. No, regenerative gets talking about the climate and organic was invented before anybody thought of the climate, but the solutions to the climate are real organic. So, you know, it's my goal to make real organic be the organic label in America. And we can do that, we can do that. We can make it the real organic label. We can make it the organic label in, in the Northeast. That would be relatively easy and it's happening. It's happening. And I'm not here to like promote a brand. I'm honestly not. It, it, the, the purpose of the Real Organic Project is not to promote a brand. It is to build a movement. And, and that's what has gotten lost in a lot of the organic movement out there. And people are, wandering around dazed and confused because they go, well, you know, it all seems hopeless, right? We lost it. And, and we did, we, we did lose control of the National Organic Program. And we should acknowledge that, that they are not us. What they certify is not what we think of as organic, but what we think of as organic is just as important or more important, because they're right, we didn't know about climate, is more important than it ever was before. And it's an important movement and we have to get back to dealing with it as a movement because we never won. We had some small victories, but we never won that war and we never will win it. It's always gonna be a work in progress. All right, that's like half an hour of me ranting. So maybe we should throw this open, Laura, and see what questions, if any, there are or things that people wanna say. Okay. Uh, we've had a few come in, a few questions. Um, the plan that you were just talking about, the farm to fork, uh, is that the same plan that Vilsack had criticized? Yes. <laughs> Actually, he criticized it in between being secretary and being secretary when he was just a chief lobbyist for the conventional dairy industry. And he was at one of those conferences and he yeah, just trashed it as being you know unscientific and you know, basically, you know, this this primitive religious thing, it was terrible, it was terrible. And, and now he is the Secretary of Agriculture and I have not heard him go back on anything he said there, so yes. Does he have a stance on it as Secretary or has he made any comments? Well, the USDA has definitely made comments and they don't like <clears throat> it at all, mm -hmm. so, uh, I didn't come, I do have the quotations and um, I, I, well, I'll tell you what, we have a letter. If you go to our website, realorganicproject.org and go to the letters section. And unfortunately we have a lot of letters or fortunately. So mm -hmm. it is a little hard to find, but if you go down and search for one about Vilsack and farm to fork, I think there were two of them back to back. And I definitely put in Vilsack's quotation and the one from a USDA guy. And they're, they're, it's a declaration of war. There's no doubt about it. 
And in the symposium that just ended, uh, Shelley Pingree and um, Senator Tester agreed. And they said, yeah, we got to turn this around. The USDA is wrong about this. So it's not subtle. It's not a secret how the USDA feels about this. They are representing the interests of big chemical, you know, big ag. That's what they're doing. They're representing Syngenta and Bayer Monsanto. So, and for those people, this is a declaration of war. Cut our use of pesticides in half? Oh my God, the economic ramifications for those companies, unbelievable. So I'm sure that they're terrified. What's going on? Government is getting out of control here, meaning out of our control. <laughs> Um, Jean was wondering, in your opinion, how much that has transpired in the organic system has been the result of the fact that the government was put in charge of overseeing the whole operation? Okay, this is a great, great question. So I have to say something that might be surprising. I mean, of course, it's the government is a great problem in this, but the truth is, it's not about government, it's about power. And if the government hadn't gotten involved, we would have the same fight going on. If you look at um, fair trade, I don't know if anybody tracks fair trade. It's not very big in the US, it's a big thing in the EU. And do you know the difference between fair trade and fair trade USA? Because you're not supposed to. Fair trade came first, and it was actually there to protect the workers and to try and make sure that they got good contracts for their work and were treated well. And, you know, money was set aside for projects to support them. Fair Trade USA was the industry's response in order to give a greenwash to these huge plantation companies. And the logos look the same. The names look the same. And there are other things. I think the Rainforest Alliance is one of the problematic ones. If you want to learn more about that, I can't quote it because I can't remember the name. So I won't tell you that. There's a great podcast series, but I don't remember the name. So um, the government getting involved was a miracle, in my opinion, that that got passed through Congress because the Organic Food Production Act is a good law. They actually did a good job. And my hat's off to Kathleen Merrigan and Grace Gershuni and anyone else who worked on that. It was a good law. And my hat's way off to Pat Leahy for getting that through, which was really a sleight of hand to get that passed through Congress, both, both houses. Things have gone badly since then. You know, the USDA has not been our friend. They never were. They came in. The first, the first Secretary of Agriculture said, okay, we're going to do this because we have to. Congress is making us. But I want to make very clear, we are not and will never say that organic food or farming is better than conventional. So they were not being our advocates. They were simply saying, but we agree to be the referee and we'll keep, keep it clear and clean and that if these are the standards, they're going to be enforced. And there've been two problems. And the first one is bad standards. And the second one is, and they aren't enforced anyway. So it's a problem. It's gonna be the work of generations to straighten it out, um, which is why we can't wait until we get it straight, which is why we're not a reform movement. I, I, I do work on reform. And we have one, at least one small victory. We got them to stop allowing glyphosate before laying down the plastic for their hydroponic berries, right? We, we won that one. But that's the only one I can think of that we've won, honestly, in quite a while. Back when they passed the pasture rule, that was a huge victory, except they don't enforce it. So what's the difference? And we've had many great recommendations come out of the National Organic Standards Board, but they never act on them. So we have a system in there that's fairly broken and reform, 
you know, maybe if we had a, a, a wild person as president and she or he put in a wild person as secretary of agriculture, maybe. But as Francis Tickey says in the symposium, yeah, but as soon as they're out of office, everything will go back because the, the, the drag of that much money, these, these, are, these are huge industries. These chemical companies, the food industry, big retail, they're all huge and they have tremendous money and they spend it freely on lobbying. So that's a tough thing to win, reform. We should keep trying. We should keep trying, but we should build something else. We should build the thing that, that we want and, and set it off and let it float. And then we can all crawl on board and make, tootle off to where we want to go. I, maybe I answered that somewhere in there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned something about there being a plan B. I don't know if you remember what that was in reference to. Mm, plan um, B. And Claire was wondering what it is. <laughs> what is plan B? Yeah. Gosh, Claire, <laughs> do you remember what I said before I said there was a plan B? Sorry about that. Maybe we could come back to it and she's able yeah. to get it. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, I might know. Maybe, um, Claire, put a thumbs up. Was I talking about how we're going to save the dairy farms? And and there was a plan B? Yes. Yeah, okay. There you go. Good. All right. Good memory. Yeah, Thank you. all right. I remember. <laughs> which is a miracle. Um, well, Gary Hirschfeld has a plan B. I, I don't know, Gary is a New Hampshire resident and the founder of Stonyfield. And he has worked hard to create um, something called the Northeast Organic Family Farm Partnership. It's not a great marketing name, but there it is. And he's trying to create a brand, a label that not that they won't put the label on the product, but in the store, he's working with stores and with colleges and, you know, cafeterias and prisons to, to put, um, make a commitment to carry and highlight products that qualify for this, this brand. And it would be essentially, it would be Organic Valley and Stonyfield and a whole bunch of small independent farms. And it would not be Horizon. It, that's the basic idea. I mean, he has a lot of fancy rules to try and get there, but that's the goal. And to try and make it that people are buying regional milk. And there are some challenges with this plan. Um, it, it is not perfect, but it is the most vigorous response I've seen that might, might save some of these farms and might move shoppers, eaters, to be able to go to the store and buy what they think they're buying. There are challenges with it. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not a total uh, in love with it, but I'm also not opposed to it. I don't see it'll do a great deal of harm and it might do some great deal of good. Okay, great. Um, and another relevant question on that topic just came in. Um, Edith is wondering what your thoughts are about the way that Lactalis and Gary Hirschberg have defined Northeastern milk as a product that merely contains more than 50%. Is it New England or Northeast milk? They have a defined region. Yeah. So uh, it kind of cuts up through New York and it's everything towards the coast from there. Okay. And is, I guess she's wondering, is that a huge loophole that damages the actual meaning of the word? Northeast. It it certainly puts it in doubt, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I've asked Gary the same question, and his response was, "Well, for Organic Valley and for Stonyfield, a hundred percent of their fluid milk that they sell in this region is from this region, but that the powdered milk and the cheese and maybe the yogurt." are coming more from the Midwest. And okay, that's great. It'd be nice if there was more transparency so we could know what the truth is. And in fact, we announced yesterday 
our Just Ask campaign has a new, new chapter to it, which is to write these companies and write Horizon and ask them if they will please list all the farms, all the farms that they buy milk from. And we know that they all buy milk from small farms, they all do, but we don't know whether they buy milk from CAFOs. And none of them are willing to list their suppliers. And they all say, well, that's a privacy issue. We can't list them without their permission. I'm like, fine, I get their permission. But, but and say, oh yeah, well, two farms wouldn't give their permission. Or they say it's a proprietary thing. And I'm I like, what are you talking about? The, the world is drowning in organic milk right now. It's like, are you afraid someone's gonna poach your farms? So I think, I think the excuses for not doing it are, are not legitimate. And I think that it's perfectly possible to work around what, what other supplier won't list their, you know, the vendors who, what, what other processor won't list where they get their stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that would address a lot of the concerns with um, things like 50%. I agree, I think the language is terrible. You can't say if it's 50% regional that it's regional, it isn't. Now, if what he says is true, then, oh, no, actually, it's 100%, but the rule is just stated in a clumsy way. So I, I, I'm really not trying to go after Gary. I, I think he's trying to work something out here. I, I believe him, but I think he's got to do a little bit better job to get the kind of buy-in from all of you that he would like to get. Mm -hmm. I will say that the farmers who are losing their contracts and the farmers who have contracts with Organic Valley or Stonyfield, by and large, support this as far as I can tell. And for me, okay, if the farmers support it, uh, I will too. The small independent farmers, they, they don't even really know what it is. They somehow agreed to be part of it. It's fine. It, it, you know, they're not against it. They're not for it. But the farmers who are actually make their living with a contract to a bigger processor, I think that they support it. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's see. Yes. Megan is wondering, with so many confusing labels, what would be your advice for the general consumer? <clears throat> yeah. So, geez, Megan, <laughs> am I looking at you? Can you wave? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not. Not. You're. You're. You're off screen. Um, it's a tough one, you know, there's so, it's such a rich question. So there are a lot of labels and there will be even more. And part of the reason for that is because the, the, uh, greenwashers have figured out how to do this. And it is much better to look like you've joined a movement than it is to oppose it. And they learned this way back in the beginning of the climate change debates. And the oil companies first tried to attack, you know, they tried to attack um, Ralph Nader and they tried to attack uh, Rachel Carson. And it worked with Ralph Nader. They kind of made him into a kook. It didn't work with Rachel Carson. She went on to die of cancer. And so she became a saint. And it, the whole thing blew up in their face when they tried to attack her. And they did. They tried to attack her viciously and very... <laughs> purposefully. And, and at the end of that, their PR people said, that didn't work. <laughs> we came out looking like the bad guys. So the next round, they said, and, and the oil companies knew that climate change was a reality. They knew it before the rest of us. And the next round, they said, we want to help. We get it. This is real. We understand. We want a place at the table. And when they got a place at the table, they said, we want voluntary standards that we're going to impose on ourselves and we're going to enforce it ourselves. And that's exactly what happened. And it set the climate change movement back by a decade or two. So they learn how to be really good at greenwashing. And the trick is, I want to be in the picture with you. And I agree with you. And, you know, it's just they never do anything to actually change. 
So that's the problem with all these labels is a lot of them are le legitimate. It's we're back to the, the one of fair trade and fair trade USA. You can't blame fair trade because somebody else ripped them off and made one that looks just like it. Fair trade was doing the right thing. They were trying very hard to try and speak for the workers in the Southern hemisphere who are working for pennies in very unsafe conditions with no protections. You know what the, the shirtwaist, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, right? About a hundred years ago, it was a big deal. It was a terrible thing. And a lot of women died in that fire because they were locked in to a, a, a place that was making clothing. And they couldn't get out when there was a fire. It was in very unsafe conditions and no fire escapes and the doors were locked. And, but that event, created a movement in America that propelled real reform and the creation of, you know, occupational safety and health, you know, OSHA, and created, you know, the kind of standards that we now take for granted. And as a result, we have a much safer workplace. But the result has been to push all of that making of clothing to places like Sri Lanka. And they're working for the same wages that people worked at 150 years ago when adjusted for inflation and under the same unsafe working conditions. So this is what we have to guard against. And it, how in the world are we supposed to tell if it's safe in Sri Lanka? We could see what was happening in the Lower East Side, but we can't see what's happening in Sri Lanka. And that's where labeling comes in. But we just have to understand we're going to have to be responsible to be informed. We're gonna to have to be responsible for ourselves to be informed enough to make good decisions because there are industries that are absolutely take, you know, their whole goal is to confuse us and deceive us. So it's not gonna be easy. And I'm sorry about the labels. I am, I, I made mine, I lost it. I made mine so big that you, you can't mistake it, but <laughs> it's like big label. It's like that one, right? But at least it's enough to go, what does that mean? And that's the other part of it. We can't just get a good feel good label. We have to keep talking and learning as everybody is here tonight. We're all trying to figure this out. Yeah. Oh, oh one last thing. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Go to the beer section in the store, in the supermarket now. Talk about a lot of labels. How many brands of beer are there now, right? 100, 50, I don't know. And it's a, it's a revolution because 20 years ago, there were like five. And now they, there aren't just you know 50 or 100 different beer companies, but they've taken the market. They have like half the market in America. It's amazing. So we shouldn't be overwhelmed by like, so many labels, we should go, oh, good. It's like some wine is better than other wine. Let me learn how to identify it. The EU has a lot of add-on labels. Every country's got two or three, like the Real Organic Project, that are above and beyond their base organic label, which is above and beyond our base organic label. OK. Very cool. Thank you. Um, uh, Jane's wondering what you think would be the best way to educate the populace about all that we know and talk about in forums like this? How do we spread the word? I think we need a Netflix drama <laughs> that involves, you know, uh, uh, an embittered farmer and his, you know, uh, art designer wife. I don't know, I said farmer, but the far embittered farmer could be a woman and her art, art director husband, I don't know. Um, you know, we're trying to do it every way we can. So we send out weekly letters, which can be grueling, I can tell you, to have to write another interesting letter. Um, but my good co-director writes a lot of them too, Lindley Dixon. Um, I, I mean, I think that we do need to be creative we're, we're working with, this, with the ways we know. We have conferences like this. We have community webs like NOFA, very important. And we 
you know, the, the webs need to understand that, that we're all connected. NOFA is connected to Mafka and it's connected to NOFA Vermont and, and we are connected to California. So there's so much information, it's, it's overwhelming now. Uh, you know, there's just so much to, to access to learn. Go, go watch our, our, our symposium. We now have seven sessions. The first five are just for free and the last two you can pay for for a little while and then they'll be free too. And, um, you know, the information is available and it's coming out all the time. Civil Eats is a fantastic resource for that. Talk about it with your friends. Talk about it at the table. Uh, forward our letter. Maybe somebody will like it. The majority of our opens of the letter are from forwards. It's fascinating. So every week, what, two or three weeks ago, we had 4,000 opens, but we had 4,000 opens from the people we sent it to, but we had 10,000 opens total. All the rest were forwards. Fantastic. Wow. It's amazing. Uh, Gene says he thinks your weekly emails rock. <laughs> and I Thank agree that they're amazing. <laughs> um, well, Gene so posts really great stuff on, on Facebook and all, and he sends letters to me, so I appreciate it. Okay, wait one second, because my battery okay. is dying. I just have okay. to go get my plug. I'll be okay. right back. Sounds good. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, just want to make sure I get to this question. Um, Emma asked, maybe you covered it earlier, but she was wondering if the Real Organic label certifies aquaponic producers. No, um, we don't. I don't have any problem with aquaponics. I think it's great. I don't think it's organic. It doesn't mean it's bad, it's just different. Mm -hmm. So no, we don't. We, we adopted pretty much the world standard, which is that, um, you know, plants that evolved in the soil must be grown in the soil, meaning no barriers between the topsoil, the subsoil and the bedrock. It's a simple, it's a simple standard. Thank you. Um, okay, Joan has a question. I'm going to unmute her. She'd like to ask it aloud. Okay. I hate being muted. I can't stand it. I hate it. And they know it at NOFA. Um, um, it shook me to hear at your symposium that our federal budget spends more money on agriculture than they spend on the military machine. Can you sort of re word that to sort of sure. bring it home to our audience? Well, that was Shelley Pingree and Congresswoman from Maine. And what she said, as I recall, because I've heard her say it a couple of times, is that the, the agriculture food industry spend more money on lobbying than the defense industry. So they spend, the, Big, big food, big ag spends about $350 million a year persuading Congress to do what they want. And as she said, and that's more than the defense industry spends. So they're the food is the bigger industry. And um, but the number she gave was actually about what they spend lobbying, lobbying okay, and influencing Congress, Thank you. which is she said, this is what we're up against. And Shelly's been on our side since before day one, certainly long before she got to Congress. And you know she is an organic farmer, but uh, it's tough. It's tough in Congress. And you got people who are, uh, as some have said, like Neanderthals. I mean, they really, really believe in chemicals, <laughs> you know, better living through chemistry. And, um, and they get a lot of money for that too. 
Okay. I'll turn my mic off. <laughs> yeah. um, we have about three minutes left. Would you mind taking one more question or should? I'm fine. Time for that? Okay. Mom's away. Great. Great. Um, Jan asked, she said there, she's glad to hear there are many political opinions that are using your certification. Um, and she's wondering how you account for this. Um, and added that with the organic, current organic community, it seems as though you must be of a certain political party in order to be part of the organic movement. Yeah, boy, that's not true at all. You get out to the Midwest, and um, I don't know if you've heard the beginning of the symposium. There's this wonderful thing where Helen Keyes talks about the organic movement. And she said this time when these old generational farmers and the hippies came together and they created this new movement. But there's a lot of um, a lot of belief in uh, healthy soil, good food, um, and and I would say anti-corporation. I'll tell a little brief story. So uh, our our chief of certification goes and visits all different kinds of farms, all different kinds of people, and he visited this one. And the guy comes out, and he the guy's friendly, but he's wearing a hat that's got crossed semi-automatic rifles on it. I think, I can't remember if it was behind a Confederate flag or whatever, but, but Ariel was like wondering, he said, geez, I'm curious why you reached out to get certified by us. And the guy said, well, you hate corporations and we hate corporations. So I figured, you know, we, we could find some common ground here. And, um, you know, so it, it is interesting because I'm from the bluest of blue states. And, uh, but it is true that that this does transcend, can transcend uh, party and, and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, in Congress, it is true that most of the champions of Real Organic are Democrats. That is true, but not 100%, not 100%. I've heard Republican congressmen from Illinois get up and put it right to Vilsack for, or it wasn't Vilsack, it was one of his minions for, for not enforcing real organic, not not getting integrity. So um, we have supporters. Thank you. Um, Ellen has raised her hand, so I'm going to unmute her and allow her to ask one last question and then we'll close. Okay, I think I've unmuted. There we go. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, I've heard you speak a few times and I really appreciate what you're doing, Dave. Um, so, you know, as you were talking about Shelly Pingree, I'm just going to ask people to envision what it would be like if she were the Secretary of Agriculture. Just kind of going there. And, you know, having been lobbied uh, in three states now, um, I just wanted to point out to folks who might not be so aware that they come on every level. So the second the word organic shows up or pesticide shows up, they're on it in, in a 200 person town or a 5 million person state. So I'm just wondering how we can like kind of almost go to lobby school in, in a way so that we can, um, the room have the skills but also be speaking the truth but also be able to really present a counter narrative but also be able to get in the room to yeah. speak to you know mayors to congress people to you know state legislators uh, ellen is that right yes yes yeah i i completely agree um and I think that we do need to consciously work on those skills. Uh, mm. I would call them leadership skills. Uh, and I, I have thought about it. You know what I'd really like to do is start an organic breakfast, like, uh, like the uh, prayer breakfast that they have in Congress. I'd like to have an organic breakfast that both parties come to. And it's a big party every year. And we talk about these serious issues. And I haven't gotten much support on that from other organizations yet, but, uh, and you know, COVID kind of shut down all kinds of public 
breakfasts and gatherings. But I think it's right. And we need to, what I found is an awful lot of Congress people are very, very willing to talk and their staffs are very willing to talk and senators very willing to talk. So um, we, we can do more. Organic Farmers Association also really consciously works on that. That's, that is their mission. Their mission is reform. And so in terms of working with Congress, I work with them too, I'm part of that. It's a good group for that. I think it's so important to feed people well, you know, like great organic food. When we actually tried to do a law in New Hampshire many years ago, we gave them some damn good food and they were like, oh, what is this? Cause they love getting that free lunch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I think that we're two minutes past, so we should wrap up. Uh, Dave, do you have any closing thoughts, or should we? No, uh, everyone's doing the work. I mean, I I do think you know the one thing I've learned in in as I got drawn into this is this is really fun. You know, it's just, you get to talk to just great people. I very seldom am in an argument. I'm always, always talking with people who are teaching me or I'm teaching them or sharing <laughs> and it's fun. So keep going. You guys are great. Thank you. All right. So this concludes our workshop. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us today. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, our next session is tomorrow, Tuesday, February 8th at noon, and that is From Seed to Harvest, Optimizing Your Seed Investment with Paul Feenan of High Mowing uh, Organic Seeds. Uh, and in the meantime, check out our virtual exhibitor fair, pop the links in the chat here, um, that's featuring 17 different exhibitors, including our conference bookstore hosted by Main Street Bookends. When you order any books through Main Street Bookends and include NOFA NH in the comments, 20% of proceeds will be donated back to NOFA. Uh, and finally, please mark your calendars for our upcoming programs. On February 17th, we have a Farm Bill listening session that NOFA's policy committee is hosting. And our Feeding the Family Organic Gardening series, which is six, six workshops every other week from February 22nd to May 3rd. And our bulk order program, you can save on farming and gardening supplies by ordering through us. And the order deadline is February 28th uh, with order pickup on March 19th and 20th in Andover, New Hampshire, Ware and Rochester. And that's all. Thank you so much for joining us.